Hey guys, welcome back to Axios. We are so glad you are here to join us tonight. This is our first Axios of the 2024-2025 school year. We are super excited that you are with us right now. Tonight we're kicking off a brand new series based on apologetics called Sorry Not Sorry. And we're going to go ahead and get started with that sermon right now. Hey, if you guys uh, missed it early, if you want something to take notes on, um, I have them right up here. I'll be glad to pass one out to you real quickly. Grab your pen if you need it as well. Um, but we're going to go ahead and jump start tonight. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever had to prove something, but you didn't really know how to communicate it or articulate it? You know, like, for example, like when some people try to tell you that LeBron James is the GOAT of the NBA, but they really can't make a good case for why they believe that. Besides... Everyone knows that Michael Jordan is the, the ghost of the NBA. For me, I remember this one time when I was in high school, and I had this job after school where, where I worked. And I got into a debate with, with an atheist. And he was questioning me why I believed what I believed. And to be honest, I would love to sit here and tell you, I did a great job of defending my faith. But I didn't. I didn't do a good job at all, honestly about the best thing that I could come up with at the time for why I believed, why I believed, it was, well, I had faith. That was really the end of the argument. It really wasn't much of a, of a case that I was making, honestly. You know, it can be difficult when we know the truth, but we don't know how to defend the truth. And that's why we have this need for apologetics. And apologetics is key. We need to know how to defend our faith to those who don't believe. Now, some of you might be thinking, Andy, what, what's this word apologetics? Are, are you apologizing for something? Did you do something wrong? And, and here's what it is. Apologetics is a branch of Christian theology that focuses on providing reasons and evidence for faith. For, for you all, you might you kind of think of it as giving a thoughtful answer to really tough questions about Christianity. Like, why we believe in God. Why Jesus is important. Why the Bible matters. You see, it's about being able to explain and defend your beliefs in a way that makes sense to others and to yourself. You do this by using things like logic, history, science, personal experiences. You see, over the next several weeks, we are going to spend our time here at Axios talking about apologetics. And you probably think, well, why now, Andy? Why, why are we going to do this now? We've never talked about apologetics before. Why are we going to do this now? This is the reason for the why. It's because our school year just started. I want you guys to have the greatest school year you have ever had in life. I want you to be able to defend your faith. Defend why you believe in God. Defend why you have faith in God. Because I'm going to be honest with you guys. You have a front row seat to where there's more loss than I can ever get to. See, you have access to people in your schools I don't have access to. You are a frontline warrior in your school to leading lost people to Christ. And because life is hard, people will ask you hard, tough questions. And because I like to live my life with something called the P6 mentality. It's like the six P's of life. You're probably, well, Andy, what are you talking about? All these P's here. And this is what it stands for. Prior proper planning prevents poor performance. Why, why use prior proper planning in this area of your life? Because if you don't prior proper planning, 
then you're not going to be able to prevent yourself from having a poor performance. You see, this advice is good for every area of life. It's not just good for in your schools, for defending your faith. It's quite literally good for everything. This is literally like one of my life mottos since I was a senior in high school when I learned this. And in high school, there was actually the seventh P that my teacher taught me. That's why I see Cam giggling back there because she's heard that seventh P before. But for tonight, we're talking about prior proper planning prevents poor performance. I'm not going to tell you right now. If you know, you know. Some of you guys know. I can tell. I can see it in your face. I'm not going to tell you right now. But why use this? Because this really helps out when it comes to defending your faith. To start off this series, we're going to answer a very hard question that every Christian is going to get asked this question. It's a question that I cannot tell you how many times people have came up to me and asked me this question. You have probably asked yourself this question. I have asked other people this one question. You have probably had people come up to you asking you this question. And this question is this, is God real? How do we prove that that God is real? Outside of like the clear evidence in nature and personal experience, Scripture really helps us understand how we can respond to people who question the existence of God. So I want to look at some Scripture right off the bat. This comes from the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 20. And this is what Paul tells us. For his invisible attributes... That is, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen since the creation of the world being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuses. Here we see Paul saying that ever since the beginning, you can see God's vibe in everything that he has made. Everything from the universe to nature shouts out one truth. That he's real and that he's powerful. So no one should have any excuse for not to believe in him. Paul's telling us that God, had, that God has plainly shown us what is obvious about him to everyone. How has he done that? Well, this verse answers that the obvious was made from God. Specifically, Paul drives home the point that we can easily know at least some of the things about God just by looking at creation. We should look at what is visible all around us in nature and what God has made and arrive to some very obvious conclusions. Adding one and one together, we should understand from nature that God has eternal power and he has a divine nature about himself. See, nature is so magnificent that there has to be a creator. There has to be a creator behind it. It just couldn't all be intentionally random and all of a sudden, bam, it was there. I I love hearing signs like, well, you had to have all these things perfectly have to happen. This had to happen perfectly. This had to happen. This had all this stuff had to happen perfectly. Okay, well, to me, God is perfect. I know that. Paul is saying that with this kind of power, it would take something incredible to create everything that would need to be endless. It would need to be an unstoppable power. See, that kind of power cannot come from a mere mortal human being, but it had to come from someone divine. It has to be God. When we look at nature, we can realize that there's a creator that we are held accountable to, especially in today's world. You know, some people... Some people might argue that, well, just looking at nature doesn't automatically lead to believing in God. You see, with all the theories about how the universe started, some might even think that it proves just the opposite, actually. That there is no God. But that excuse, it doesn't fly with God. This idea is super important, especially when you think about what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 and 8. And this is what he says in these two verses here. Ask. And it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks the door will be opened. You see God gives everyone enough clues to start seeking him. If you generally start looking for God. Spoiler alert. You're going to find God. So if people don't figure it out that that there's a God just by looking at creation, 
then start looking for him. Start searching for him and you're going to find him. If they don't do that, then they're clearly ignoring the obvious. You see, God has made it clear through our brains to get it that and choosing to believe otherwise, it's just pushing the truth that we naturally know because we're hardwired to know this already. But what does it mean for us tonight here at Axios? Well, it starts with faith. Faith can be understood as trust or confidence in something you can't see, but you know it's real. It's like believing in Wi-Fi. I mean, you can't see Wi-Fi floating here in the air. I I can't see it. I can't really touch Wi-Fi. But I know it's there because I can experience its effects. My phone tells me there's Wi-Fi. My iPad tells me there's Wi-Fi. My computer tells me there's Wi-Fi. This television tells me there's Wi-Fi. Because I trust the experience of Wi-Fi right now. See, for us as Christians, faith means trusting God and believing in his promises. Even when you can't see or understand everything. It's about having confidence that God is with you. That God is going to guide you. Even when life is is uncertain and it's hard. This is summed up beautifully in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. This is what the writer says. He says, Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. See, this verse shows us that faith is not just wishful thinking. It's a solid trust in God's reality and that His work is in your life even when you can't see it with your own eyes. I mentioned Wi-Fi a few minutes ago. Another great tool when talking to people about God is the age-old adage, the old illustration of wind. Can you see the wind? No. Do you experience the wind? Yes. Do you acknowledge its existence? Yes. We were down, down, downstairs outside a while ago playing nine square, and we were seeing the effects of the wind just by blowing the ball around just a little bit. You see, we... we acknowledge its existence, and we feel its presence and effect. Our culture has put their faith in the God of science and reason, meaning that whatever falls outside of what we can't immediately touch, see, taste, feel, or smell is true. It doesn't take long to realize that there has to be something more than the physical. You see, each of us has experienced in an inherent spirituality that goes beyond the physical. It points us to a higher power. And this is being, that, that being, let me back up here, that this higher power, that that being is someone that we call a good father who created us, who loves us, who wants a relationship with us. Even when you can't see or touch God, he's still absolutely real. And he's always at work around us and in our lives. Believe in him even when you can't see him. See, this is the main point for the week, and I don't want you to miss this tonight. That we need to walk by faith, not by sight. I love the movie Indiana Jones. I love all the Indiana Jones movies, but in particular, I really love The Last Crusade. If you've never seen that, it's the third movie. And it's getting towards the end of the movie. And in Indiana, he's, he's going through this cave in the middle of the desert. And he gets this big old gap in the middle of the cave. And it's too far to jump. And he's looking at the notes and says, take a leap of faith. And he's looking at this diagram that his dad wrote out for him and drew him. And it shows a man walking on thin air. He's like, I can't jump this. How am I supposed to do it? And so he finally just like, okay, I'm just going to take this step of faith. And he holds his foot out and he takes that step. And there's just like this invisible bridge he can't see. And he just slowly walks across until he gets to the other side. He grabs a handful of dirt and he throws it back so he can see it when he's coming back. You see, that's what, that's what it means to walk by faith, not by sight. A few verses later in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, we read this right here. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. In the following verses of Hebrews here, chapter 11, the writer goes on to point out examples of believers who demonstrated real saving faith in God. You see, these people are called like the heroes of faith or the faithful hall of fame, depending on what you want to call them. 
And these people are the heroes that's mentioned in Hebrews 11. It starts with Abel, the son of Adam and Eve, that he offered a better sacrifice than Cain. Enoch, man, he, he, he uh, pleased God and he was taken up to heaven without dying. Noah built an ark to save his family. Abraham obeyed God's call to leave his home, and later obeyed the call to sacrifice his son Isaac. Sarah believed that God promised, believed in God's promise that he would give her a son, and that even in her old age, she would get pregnant. As somebody told me last year at Axios, she was way past beekeeping age. Um, then you had Isaac, who blessed Jacob and Esau concerning their future, and Jacob blessed Joseph's sons and worshiped as he leaned on a staff. Joseph spoke about the exodus to the Israelites and gave them instructions about what to do with his bones. Moses, he chose to suffer with the people of, e of Egypt. The Israelites there in slavery and then, gave and then led them out of Egypt. The Israelites, man, they passed through the Red Sea on dry ground. And Rahab the prostitute, man, she hid the Israelites from spies and was spared when Jericho was destroyed. Hebrews 11 goes on to mention other heroes like Gideon, Samson, David, Samuel, and other prophets, all who demonstrated faith to God through their actions. You see, each example of faith demonstrates trust that that person knew and had that reassurance that God would act according to his promises. See, they're... Their assurance and their conviction of faith was not a blind belief or gullibility or wishful thinking. These were ordinary people who did extraordinary things with God. Do you know what the difference was between them and you? You're alive today and they died a long, long time ago. They are just ordinary people who did extraordinary things for God. Go back and study these various people. That Hebrews 11 mentions. You'll see that their faith was not naively accepting fairy tales. When you read their stories, it doesn't start off with a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. It doesn't start off with once upon a time because it's not a fairy tale. These are real events that actually happened. These people acted in full confidence that God would do as he promised and based on those experiences. That's why they had faith. So we talked tonight about how scripture and faith helps us understand. Bless you. Bless you again. Helps us um, have faith and understand and trust in God. Even when we can't physically see him with our own eyes. But here's one more very important aspect of living a life that honors, honors God. And that is that we need to have a healthy fear of God. See, scripture tells us dozens of times to live in fear of the Lord. Now, when I say fear, I don't mean like, ah, oh, like I'm scared. Like he's out to get you. That's not what I'm talking about at all. But this kind of fear is about having a, a deep respect for God, living in awe and reverence for who God is. It's understanding his greatness, his power, his authority over everything, including our own lives. Psalms chapter 111, verse 10. This is what King David writes. He says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his instructions have good insight. His praise endures forever. See, King David tells us that fearing God is where true wisdom starts. Is that when you live with this kind of respect for God, it shapes how you make decisions in life. It shapes how you treat other people, how you live your life. It's, it's like recognizing that God isn't just some distant figure. That God is right here. And he's deeply involved in your life right now. And he's deserving of our full attention and honor. When we live in, in awe of God and we respect him through obedience, then he will cause us to grow in wisdom just like scripture promise. When it comes to apologetics and defending your faith, I gotta be honest, wisdom is a great tool to have on your side. See, we have a real fear. When we have a real fear and a healthy respect for God, it helps us live our lives in a way that follows his lead. It means that we're more likely going to listen to him with his guidance and to help us steer us clear of things that are going to cause us to, to mess up and go down the wrong path away from him. 
this kind of respect isn't about being scared. It's about being empowered. It gives you the wisdom to handle life's ups and downs with God at the heart of it all. You see, with wisdom comes responsibility. And it's up to us to help others who don't believe in God. To help a person understand that God wants a relationship with that person. You see, we need to encourage them to walk with God and not walk away from God. So what does that mean for us tonight? It means that as you walk by faith and you recognize God's presence in creation, you should also live with a deep respect for God in every single part of your life. So I want to challenge you to do something. We're here at the beginning of the school year still. Some of you guys have been back for a couple of weeks. I know there's uh, still a handful of people that will actually start in a few more weeks. Uh, and that's okay. But here's what I want to challenge you to do. I want to challenge you to kick off each day with respect and awe for God. I want you to recognize how awesome he is and let that shape how you live your life. I want you to approach life with a real sense of reverence for God. And you're going to find yourself getting wiser, living out his truth and his love more fully. As we wrap up our first axios of tonight, of the school year, I want you to remember what our main point is. And that is that we need to walk by faith, not by sight. It's about having confidence that is backed up by the evidence that we find in Scripture. In a world all around us, we can experience God's presence in our lives right now. Just like the heroes of faith that we mentioned a few minutes ago, we're called to live out our faith in the exact same confidence and conviction that they did. See, if God can take these ordinary people and do extraordinary things through faith, then what can God do through you when you fully trust Him? This week, my challenge to you is this, to walk by faith, not by sight. To see God's fingerprints in everything all around you. Have respect for him in all areas of life. Before I was in youth ministry, I did kids ministry for a long time. And every year at VBS, we would tell our kids this at the end of the night. Hey, look for God. We call these God sighting moments. And we would challenge kids. Hey, when you go home, look for God. And before you come back, Tomorrow, look for God. And I want you to tell us all about it. And we would spend the first part of our night, hey, tell us, where did you see God at? And kids, man, man, I wish I had faith like a child some days. I really do. Because kids are like, oh, I saw, I saw Jesus protect my mom on the way to work when somebody ran a red light. I saw, I, saw, uh, I saw God today when he gave us rain for the first time in like weeks. See, look for God and you're going to see God. You're going to face God tough questions in life about your faith. And you might even have some doubts, but don't shy away from them. I want you to use those as opportunities to grow your faith, to share what you believe and why you believe it with other people. Don't forget, God has given you everything that you need to defend your faith right now. You have his word, you have his creation, and you also have the Holy Spirit guiding you. See, God's sighting moments can happen anywhere in life. So as you start off your school year, I want you to hold on to the P6 mentality. Prior proper planning prevents poor performance. I want you to plan your days with God at the center. I want you to, to live with the wisdom that comes from fearing Him. And I want you to confidently share the truth that God is real. Now we could just end it right here and be done with it, but I don't. I believe in having an invitation every night. And so maybe for you, you want to start off your school year by saying, you know what, Andy? I don't, I, I don't want to go through the darkness of this school year. I, I want to go ahead and accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. If you want to make that decision tonight, if you want to accept Jesus, get baptized, come and talk to me after we, after we pray. Maybe for some of you, you got started off on a really good note last year in your school year. And as the school year went on, you, you, you felt like you were getting further away. But then we went to TCTC in, in January, and it really got you on fire. And it gets you right back with God. But then the school year came. And by the end of the school year, you felt like you were, were starting to run low on fuel. And then summer hit, and you felt like you're running on fumes right now. 
And for you, maybe for you, you were like, you know what? I, I just want to get back to square one with God. I, I want to get back to where I'm with him. Then f- what we're talking about with you is a rededication. If that's something you want to talk about as well, I would love to have that conversation with you tonight. I'm going to pray and then I'll tell you what we're going to do next. All right, so let's go to God. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for tonight. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to, to just come out tonight, Lord, and to, to worship you, to have a, a new axios, uh, an improved axios, Lord, for what we've had in the past. I thank you for all the students that are here tonight. I know we have some students that are out sick tonight, God, and I ask that you be with those individuals and let them get to feeling better. God, be with all of our students that are starting their school year off. Let them start off strong. Let them, let them be strong warriors on the front line in their schools to reach the lost because they have access to people that, that people like me don't. So let them remember what we start talking about tonight and what we'll talk about over the next several weeks, Lord about how we can defend our faith and help be a tool that you use to win over lost souls, Lord. We ask these things to your sons in our prayer. Amen. Okay, so normally, normally we'd go to small groups tonight, but we're not doing small groups tonight. I just wanted to sort of ease into the to the year. So we're going to do something a little different here at the end of the night. Um, Christina, can you go downstairs and get that stuff that's in my freezer out of my office? So... Every year at Axios, I like to just have something fun to eat at the end of the night of our first year. Last year, I had like this big old giant cookie cake. We don't have a cookie cake this year. So I'm doing something a little different. We have like ice cream bars and ice cream cones and ice cream sandwiches. And we have some freezy pops for you guys. And so we're just going to uh, chill out for a little bit. And so we'll listen to some music, enjoy some ice cream. And there's something else. If you notice on the wall right over here, there are like two poster boards with like four sections on it. These are opportunities for you to serve here on Wednesday nights. And there are four areas for which you can serve. And I, I'm talking to our students here. You guys, you can serve because I want you to use your gifts, your talents, your abilities. And he's the, here are the four categories. The first one is helping out with the worship. If we continue to do this, you can be up here just leading right here with the videos playing. Maybe you have an instrument you want to play. You want to lead worship that way. Great. Um, another area. Please don't mess with my computer, sir. <laughs> You're making me nervous being over there. Um, another area where you can help serve is by actually sitting where Griffin's at right now and running the computer, running the slides on Wednesday night. Um, another area where you can serve is we're, we're calling this a co-host. The co-host is someone who is actually up here leading the game, so I don't have to do the game every week. Um, Maybe you have that outgoing personality and you want to lead a game, that can be for you. Or maybe you want to be a co-host and help uh, do the announcements. And so if that is something you want to do, grab a pen and just write your name on that poster board out there. We're going to leave it up for this week and next week, give you guys plenty of time to do that. And then probably starting sometime in September, we're going to go ahead and get you guys plugged into serving because I want you to use your gifts for God. And who knows, maybe you'll continue to do these things on Sunday morning downstairs for the adults one day, maybe one day soon, who knows. But that is it. Grab yourself a Freezy Pop ice cream and that is it for tonight, guys. Hey, that's going to do it for Axios tonight here at Christway. I want to invite you guys to come out and join us on Sunday mornings. We have Sunday school right here in this room every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. We have breakfast for you guys every single week. It is for our middle school and high school students. And of course, we'd love to have you in person on Wednesday nights here for Axios at 630 right here in the youth room. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me and I will see you guys later.